square root problem. And I think the first part is probably pretty straightforward, <coughs> figuring out the terms. We plug in the index value to get the term. So a sub 0 is given to be 1 to find a sub 1. We have to take and add 1 to a sub 0. So we're going to get the square root of 2 for the next term. Let's see. This word is getting worse and worse. So we have 1 comma square root of 2. And then a sub 2, we take a sub 1, add 1 to it, and take the square root. So 1 plus root 2, just like that. Everybody OK so far? And then a sub 3, a sub 3, we're going to take 1 plus a sub 2. So we're going to do this. going on. Keeps on trucking. Any questions on that part? All right. Is that good? I was trying to do like square root of three. And yeah. I eventually figured out the pattern. You know, right. Yeah. So what we, the, the trick, the trick with a sub one is that a sub one is one plus a naught. A naught is one. So there we can simplify it to square root of two. But then once we get here, it's this plus 1 inside the square roots. That square root's preserved. <clears throat> so it's a little, it's not quite as simple as just doing that, unfortunately. OK, so that's how we find our terms. Now, if we want to find the limit of this, we have the algebraic way to find what the limit of this is equal to. Or we can use the method where we take the limit of this expression here. When we take the limit of this expression here, we have to have some sort of empirical evidence that we're getting convergence. And so you could set up in Desmos and graph a chunk of this and just see if, if, this, is, if this is reasonably, if it's go going to converge, if it looks like it's going to converge. Uh, the algebra method, we would let x equal this repeated thing like that. And the um, method here is to do what to both sides? Yeah, we'll square both sides. And when we square both sides, we see that on the right we have 1 plus x. So this algebra way works pretty well. This would, this would be one way to convince us that it does converge. <clears throat> and then we factor this. Oh, it's not factorable, so what would we do? Quadratic formula, negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4. a times c is negative 1 over 2a. 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. 1 minus the square root of 5 is negative, so that's out of the question because this expression is a positive expression. So we would ignore the negative, and we would choose x equals 1 plus root 5 over 2. <coughs> so if we look at that, we know, OK, then it's got to converge to 1 plus root 5 over 2. So algebraically, that's how we could get at it. Now if we do it the calculus method, so that confirms that it does uh, converge. Now if we take this statement up here where we have a sub n plus 1 is equal to the square root, whoops, I want to put a limit in there. We're going to take the limit of both sides. So we have that. So this technique here works as long as we're assured that there's convergence. Algebraically, we just showed it converged. You could also type it into Desmos, and you'd see that it converges to something. And if you know your sequence converges, this technique will get it. And watch what we're going to get. So if we assume that it's converging to L, the limit of a sub n plus 1 is L, and we can push the limit into the square root symbol, and we get this. 
And when we square both sides, we'll get L squared. We subtract L, we subtract 1. Bada bing, we're at the same place that we were at algebraically when we squared both sides of that infinitely nested square root problem. <coughs> Either of those techniques work fine. And that is what it converges to. Right there. 1 plus root 5 over 2. <clears throat> any questions on any of the steps, sir? Will we have one like this on the exam? Maybe. <laughs> if there is one like this on the exam, it would be one where I tell you this converges, what does it converge to, so you could use this technique here. Okay. You know, you won't have technology to get that empirical evidence of convergence, so I would tell you. This converges, what does it converge to? So this technique works really well then for that, if you know it converges. <coughs> Haley? Um, so the, the technique that the um, homework system uses is A sub n over B sub n? Is so you can, you could prove that, you could look here and you could use the ratio, the ratio test, or ratio test, is that what you're? Well, it's a sub n over b sub n, so I don't know. And a sub n was 1 plus a sub n plus 1, and then b sub n was 1 plus b sub n plus a sub n. I don't think that you can tell what I'm saying right now. Do you have it written right there? Yeah. You just glance at it and... I don't know what it is. <laughs> so they are uh, taking the ratio of consecutive terms... Yes, so they're, um, all they're doing there, but the interesting thing there is that we're doing the ratio test today. Oh. This is from 8.2. The, what they're showing you right there is, uh, is, the, is, a, is a ratio test. I mean, they're kind of in okay. That feels a little premature, because with the ratio test, if you want to test whether a series converges or not, you look at the ratio of consecutive terms, and if the ratio of consecutive terms has a <coughs> limit that's less than one, then you have convergence. It and, that's, into that. and that's what they're showing. Mm -hmm. So that seems a little premature because we haven't talked about the ratio test yet. Let me look at, uh, during the break, I'll look at it more carefully just to see if there's another explanation <coughs> other than ratio test, but that seems to be what they're doing. Okay. We'll analyze it. Okay, this one, sure. uh, inverse secant. This is, it's fairly straightforward to plug in your values <laughs> and you can get an expansion for what this looks like. So this will be inverse secant of two minus inverse secant of one. So that's what I would consider the first term. And then we plug in our second index value and we get inverse secant of three minus inverse secant of two plus, et cetera, and that goes on forever. <clears throat> now, what we sort of discern when we're looking at this is that we have the first of the first group and the second of the second group that cancel. So we're going to have that same cancellation pattern all the way down. That goes on forever. So the strategy is to look at S sub n. So S sub n is going to be a finite sum. We're going to go out to the nth term. So we're looking at the nth partial sum. So above here, I've just written it as an as a infinite series. Now I'm going to stop it. Let's plug in n minus 1 to get the term before the last term for this partial sum. So if we plug in n minus 1, we're going to get inverse secant of n minus inverse secant of n minus 1. And then the last term, when we plug in n, we're going to get inverse secant of n plus 1 and minus inverse secant of n. So is there any questions on how we generated those last two terms over there? Is that okay, how we generated those last two terms? Plug in n minus 1 for the k value, and then plug in n for the k value. So that gives us these final two pairs here. That one I've kind of had to write together. But 
And so what we see is the, if we sort of think from right to left instead of left to right, the right term is canceling with the far left term. So if we come all the way down here, this is the right term, and it's going to cancel with the far left term of the previous group, right? So this one right here, the right term of this pair, is going to cancel with something in the dot, dot, dot region. But nothing's going to cancel with this one, and nothing's going to cancel with this one. So this guy will cancel with something in the dot, dot, dot. The second term of the next group will cancel with that one. So the ones that are remaining will be this one right uh, here. Let me put an X mark through that one too. And the other one that's remaining is this one. So we've got those two. So this gives us an expression for S sub N. And we have minus inverse secant of 1 plus inverse secant of m plus 1. And what is inverse secant of 1? So let's take a look at a circle. Whoops, that's not a circle. Take a look at a circle. and. When we think about a unit circle and we think about inverse secant, inverse secant is like inverse cosine. It's an angle on the top half of the circle. Every inverse trig function is an angle. Inverse sine, inverse cosecant are on the right. Inverse cosine and inverse secant are on the top. Inverse tangent is also on the right. And inverse cotangent is on the top. So it's split. Three on the right, three on top. So inverse cosine and inverse secant on top. Inverse sine and inverse cosecant are on the right. So those all kind of come paired. Sine and cosecant are together. Cosine and secant are together. But then cotan, inverse cotan and inverse tangent are separate. Inverse cotan is on top, but inverse tangent is on the right. So this says the angle on the top half of the circle with a secant value of 1. The angle on the top with a secant value of 1 is the same as the angle on top with a cosine value of 1. Because secant and, cos secant and cosine are reciprocals of each other. So if secant is 1, cosine also has to be 1. So this really is saying the angle on top with a cosine value of 1. But we can't leave the top half of the circle. So we can only go between 0 and pi. So we can't go all the way to 2 pi. We have to stay trapped up there. So the answer would have to be, would just have to be 0, right? So right there, that's our terminal ray. So that angle is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. Secant of 0 is 1 which means inverse secant of 1 is 0. Okay, so when we look at this, we have secant of 0 degrees or radians. I'm going to just put a degree there just to emphasize that's an angle. <clears throat> which means inverse secant of 1 is 0. Yeah? I'm just kind of curious. Why, why do we go with 0 instead of pi? Well, secant of pi is negative 1, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So inverse secant of negative 1 would be pi. Yep. <clears throat> inverse cosine of negative 1 would be pi. Will you talk about that, um, those end terms at the end one more time? Just and why they canceled? Uh, how you got them where they are. OK. So <laughs> when we look up at our expression, if we plug, we're plugging in k values, if we want the nth partial sum, the very last term would be a sub n. Okay. So a sub n, the last term would be when we plug n equal, uh, k equal to n. Okay. So this one, we're plugging an n in for each of those k's. Okay. And if n is the last term, if a sub n, if n is the index value for the last term, the index value for the term previous is n minus 1. 
So if we take an n minus 1 and place it in for those two k's, that's where we get those two. And that, again, then we get our cancellation first of this group, second of that group. And so that holds true all the way through. First of the first group, second of the second group. All right, so this tells us then that we have negative 1. Oh, no, I said that wrong. I looked over there. Inverse secant of 1 is 0. I should have a 0 there. So negative 0 is 0. Plus, this is, we'll just leave it like this for now. So there's our S sub n. S sub n is equal to inverse secant of n plus 1. Now, if the series converges, it's going to converge to the limit of S sub n. The sequence of partial sums converging means the series converging, the series converges. So we take the limit as n goes to infinity of S sub n, that will be S. Now we have to take the limit as n goes to infinity of inverse secant. So we need to know what inverse secant does as n goes towards infinity. So if we take a look at the graph, that will help us. So let's take a look. Uh, that's not the graph. Where is it? Uh, let's see. Let's take out that one. So there's a graph of inverse secant right there. So as n goes to infinity, inverse secant gets closer and closer to pi over 2, just like inverse tangent does. Inverse tangent gets closer and closer to pi over 2. So is it clear how we would get that graph if, I mean, that's not a graph that any of us would ever memorize. So how would we get that graph if we didn't know what, the way I would recommend getting it would be to look at the graph of, of the secant function and then you, you, know, you switch the x's and the y's. So if we take a look at the cosine graph, cosine is where secant comes from. So cosine is right there on the interval 0 to pi. So that's the top half of the circle, 0 to pi. 0 to pi is the top half of the circle. 0 to pi is the largest piece of cosine that's 1 to 1. A graph is 1 to 1 if it passes the horizontal line test and it has to pass the horizontal line test if it's going to have an inverse. And so now if we take a peek at the, at the reciprocal function here, if we take a peek at the secant function, secant is going to be looking like this. Secant is going to go up and down like that. Okay, so there's the secant function. Now, to graph an inverse, you just switch the x's and the y's. That's what an inverse is. You switch the x's and the y's. So let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, let's see. Right here. What's that point on the secant that's 0, 1? So that means 1, 0 is on the inverse secant. Now, what this is telling us is that if we come over to pi over 2, we have a vertical asymptote. So that means that if we come to pi over 2 on the y-axis, we're going to have a horizontal asymptote. So this will be a horizontal asymptote right there. And let's see. Let me move some of this stuff around a little bit. Need a little more space. <clears throat> OK, so we're at that position right now. Now let's get this point. This point over here is pi comma negative 1. So that means negative 1 comma pi is on the graph. So we've got these two points and we've got this asymptote. So let's try to figure out which way the graph is supposed to go. Should we, we, we never cross the x-axis, so that means we're never going to cross the y-axis when we go to inverses. Right? X and y are just switching. 
So we know that this curve, can't, it's got to approach the asymptotes, and it can't cross the y-axis because this secant doesn't cross the x-axis. So it, there's very little choice. It's going to have to go like that. That'll be our graph. <clears throat> so the limit of inverse secant as x goes to infinity will be pi over 2. And that is what, that's how we conclude that this is going to be pi over 2, and that's going to be the sum of our series. It'll be pi over 2. Does that make sense, Diana? Oh, where is she? <laughs> She's what I saw earlier today. She's like, can we do this one in class today? <laughs> yes. I assume you'll be there. <laughs> I know. I saw her out there like, Two minutes before class. All right. Priorities. Oh, yeah. Where's Chavez? Is she out there, too? No, they're there. They're studying their physics. They have a physics lab report they're working on. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. This one is not particularly difficult if you see a couple, if you make an observation, a couple of observations. So first off, when we think of a geometric series, a geometric series looks like this. And if we write a geometric series in closed form, we write it AR to the K, where K starts at zero. All right. So the first thing that we have to be super careful with, and if you wanted to, you could factor this A to the front and look at kind of the, the core of the series with its common ratio being multiplied. You could look at it either way. So what we first have to observe is where the series, whoops, where the series starts. So that starts at zero and that power is k. Those are the two things that we have to pay really careful attention to. Now this one over here, there's a four up there. So this is not, so the common ratio is not negative one-fifth because that four is right there. What we need to do is peel off that four. So if we write this series, we can leave that four there, but that four up there, we want to be thinking of it like this. That's minus one-fifth to the fourth, all to the kth. And then k will start at one. All right, so the r value is found by pulling that exponent's coefficient down. We know a power to a power you multiply. So this is the form that we would want to write it in. So we raise this to the fourth power. It now becomes positive. 5 times 5 is 25. 25 squared is 625. There. So now we're good with the r value. Now. Regardless of what A is, we know R. This is R right there. So this tells us that R is 1 over 625. Now to figure out A, that all depends on where the indexing starts. A lot of us might just want to say, oh, A is 4. If this started at 0, A would be 4. But this starts at 1. So A is going to equal the 4. You plug in your, your first index value to get your A. And because the first index value is 1, not 0, we need to take that into consideration. So there's our R. There's our A. And if we want to know what the value of this series is, the sum of this series is going to be A divided by 1 minus R. So we're going to do A divided by 1 minus R. Multiply everything through by 625. That'll clear the fractions out. So we have 4 divided by 625 minus 1. And so the sum of this series will look like that. 4 goes into 24 which means 4 goes into 624. Everybody know that trick? For a number to be divisible by 2, the rightmost digit has to be divisible by 2. 
For a number to be divisible by 4, the right two digits need to be divisible by 4. For a number to be divisible by 8, the right three digits would have to be divisible by 8. So that kind of pattern holds on. Because this is 2 squared, we've got to go out two places. That's divisible by 4. So this whole thing should be divisible by 4, if I remember the rule right. So 4 goes into there. 1, 31, I believe. So that will be the sum of our series. I think it's one. I got 156. Oh, did I divide wrong? The arithmetic. That's the hard part. What is it, 156? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 22 divided by. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. Glad you're awake. Okay, so that's the sum of our series. So, is there any piece of that that you want to look at more carefully? So, we need to be very careful with our index and with our power. What would A be if K started at 0? A would be 4 if K started at 0. If K started at 2, what would A be? 4 times 1 is 1 over 625 squared. Yes, yeah, so 4 over 625 squared. Yep. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? So to find your A value, plug in that first index value. That will be your A. All right. Oh, do we do three problems already? Mm -hmm. Do we do three? Oh, yeah. All right, let's top ratio test. Okay, so we're going to look at two really important tests today. The root test and the ratio test. Ratio test we'll do first. And these two tests are... The, they are nothing more than the geometric series in disguise. So these two tests are basically the geometric series. Now, the one thing that's different is with the geometric series, your R value could be positive, could be negative, didn't matter. Remember that with a geometric series, with the geometric series, we said that we had convergence if R was between negative 1 and 1, excluding the endpoints. All right, so that's for a geometric series. With the root test and the ratio test, one thing we're going to assume is that our series has positive terms. So we're going to take away the possibility of having negative terms in our series. So we're only dealing with positive terms. So let's suppose we had a geometric series with positive terms. If we had a geometric series with positive terms, wouldn't this just become r less than 1 or greater than or equal to 0? If we had positive terms, if we just took away the negative possibilities, right, we would have this. That is the conclusion. You have convergence when your r value is between 0 and 1. And the same will be true for the, true for the root test. If it's between 0 and 1, where you exclude the 1 and you include the 0, you will have convergence. Now, at the root test, we'll see in a minute, instead of an R, they use a row. No great reason for that. You could just use an R. Okay, so for the ratio test, what we are going to do is look at the limit of consecutive terms. So you have a sub k. The next term is a sub k plus 1. So you're looking at the ratio of consecutive terms and taking the limit. And then we have these results. If the r value is greater than 1, you have divergence, just like with the geometric series. Now, if r is equal to 1, that just means this test is not refined enough to tell whether the series converges or diverges. There are some series that are super <coughs> hard to analyze and you may get an inconclusive result. So that just means the test doesn't work. For this case, it means that it might converge, it might diverge. You just don't know if you get a ratio of 1. Would it ever be less than 0? Not with positive terms. So if we assume that we're dealing with positive terms, we'll never have, an, uh, we'll never have that limit be less than 0. OK. so. The ratio of consecutive terms. And I just said this is the geometric series in disguise. And here's where they talk about it. Well, I don't, let me see if I can 
let me try to blow that up a little bit so that we can, uh, so I can explain what I mean by, it's really just the geometric series. Okay, so let's, yeah, it looks a little fuzzy, but, okay. So up here, we are saying that, I may just rewrite this. We are saying that the limit of a sub k plus 1 over a sub k, so that's the limit of consecutive terms. We're going to say that limit's finite, that it's r. It has a limit. Doesn't this mean that eventually, so out in the tail of the series where convergence is decided, doesn't this mean that a sub k plus 1 it's approximately equal to r times a sub k. And if this ratio eventually is getting close to r, that means eventually the a sub k plus 1 is about r times a sub k. That's a geometric series. This says that the terms in your series, if you look out in the tail, a sub k, then a sub k plus 1, then a sub k plus 2, well, if a sub k a sub k plus 1 is about r times a sub k, then the subsequent term to that would be r times the previous term. And so we actually end up building the tail that looks like geometric series. We multiply by r, multiply by r, multiply by r, multiply by r. So if it's a geometric series, we know that we have convergence if r is less than 1 in magnitude. So that's why the ratio test is really looking at a geometric series. Now, sometimes you will get the limit to be 1, and you have to say, oh, test, test is inconclusive. But that's why it really is just an offshoot of the geometric series. OK. So let's try a ratio test. Ratio test is a really good test when you have factorials, uh, often when you have powers of k, we're going to see that the root test would actually be a little better test for this one. But re re ratio test works really well when you have powers of k, when you have factorials. It doesn't work so well if you have big square roots and uh, things like that. Uh, but the ratio test works great if you have, the ratio test works great if you have ratios uh, without roots. Ratios without roots. All right, so let's try it. So we're going to take the limit of a sub k plus 1 over a sub k. So a sub k plus 1, we plug in a k plus 1. So there's a sub k plus 1. And we divide by a sub k, which means multiply by the reciprocal of a sub k. So we get that. As k goes to infinity. So we're going to see how that's a sub k plus 1 over a sub k. a sub k plus 1, we did nothing more than replace all the k's with a k plus 1. And when we divide by a sub k, we're dividing by a fraction, so we have to multiply by its reciprocal. So we didn't change a sub k, we just took its reciprocal. So now let's cancel some factors. Let's see what we can do here. So this is the limit. This k goes to infinity. Uh, let's pair these off better. Let's look at the 2 to the k and the 2 to the k plus 1. Who knows what's going to happen with those two factors right there? How are those going to reduce? Mm, not quite. Are there more twos in the numerator or in the denominator? There's more twos in the denominator. How many more twos? One more two. So we should end up with just one half for that part. Just a, so we're left with just a single two in the denominator for that part. So if you were going to use the rule of exponents, you would do 
2 to the k minus k minus 1. So you'd get 2 to the minus 1, which leaves a 2 in the denominator. So k 2 to the negative 1, right? 2 to the negative yeah. 1. Is that what you said? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry. I thought you said 2 to the negative k. 2 to the negative 1. Yes, 2 to the negative 1. Good. And then how about this one right here? This one's a little trickier, it's not obvious. But what I'm going to do is peel off 1k plus 1, peel one of those off, and then what I'm going to do is this. So if I pull one of those off, then I'm going to be left with k plus 1 to the k over k to the k. And we can then combine these two so that we have this limit as k goes to infinity. We ran out of space already. k plus 1 over 2. We can rewrite this as 1 plus 1 over k to the k. So if we have, we have k plus 1 to the k over k to the k, we could write it like that. Okay. And then the denominator has just the single k. So that can then be distributed into the numerator, giving us that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. And what is the limit of this? Just this piece, 1 plus 1 over k to the k as k goes to infinity. That's just 1, isn't it? I've definitely heard a couple answers. What is it? E. 1 plus 1 over x to the x. Right? 1 plus 1 over n to the n in pre-calculus. Yeah, so that goes to E. So what does that mean our entire limit goes to then? If this is a con this is constant, what does k plus 1 go to? Infinity. So that means this whole limit is infinity. So what does that tell us uh, in terms, does this tell us anything about the uh, convergence of this? Say that again. So the ratio test says if we're less than 1, we get convergence. If it's equal to 1, it's inconclusive. And if it's greater than 1, okay. divergence. <laughs> so therefore, diverge by ratio test. Good. So let's go back and just look at our conclusion here. So including infinity, the series diverges. And let's. One thing I didn't ask you ahead of time, usually I say, what's your hunch? And we typically have a pretty good sense if we know the ratio, if we know which functions grow the fastest, we usually have a pretty good hunch on whether we're going for convergence or divergence. When we look at k to the k, that's one of those funny functions that's changing in the base and in the exponent. And we saw that that one grows faster than all the other functions. So we would expect divergence because k to the k is going to grow faster than 2 to the k. This is a typical exponential. And if we look at that growth chart, we have exponential, and then we have factorial, and then we have the k to the k. So the k to the k grows the quickest of them all. And since that's in the numerator, we would expect to find divergence. Mike? Will you cover that e, where you, how you got e from that just one more time? Yes. So the way we get e from that is with the log limit. So log limit. Let's review that. If we, if we have y equals, I mean, technically, we are going to take a derivative. So it's ideal if you change to, if you change to x's. And then we take the natural log of both sides. And then we take the limit of both sides. Log symbol, log. So we get to that statement there. 
So we're taking the limit of both sides. We take the log of both sides, we pull the exponent down, then we take the limit of both sides, and what, what's the trick on the right here? Push the x into the denominator, like that. Then we use L'Hopital's rule, da 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 da. We end up with a one over here, then we have to exponentiate both sides. And we'll get that y is equal to e. Yeah. So a log limit, log limit, or the limit of a log. All right, so let's go, let's, yeah, we need to move with this. I don't know how we got so crowded on here. Let's do that, cut that. Put that one on the next page. Go back. All right, let's do this second one here. All right, so same idea. We're going to take the limit of a sub k plus 1 over a sub k, the limit of consecutive terms. And that will be the limit, k plus 1 to the k plus 1, divided by k plus 1 factorial, multiplied by the reciprocal of a sub k. The reciprocal of a sub k should look like that. Now, what's our hunch on this one? Our hunch is that we would get divergence again, because k to the k is the quickest growing function that we look at. And so we would expect that to be the case. Now, if you wanted to, do you guys know the gamma function? So k factorial is a function that is a discrete function. And so you may have this feeling like, oh, I can't graph k factorial even if you converted it to x. Can you graph x factorial? We don't need that anymore. Can you graph x factorial? And the answer is actually surprisingly yes. x to the x is the gamma function. And you can actually graph it. And it's got a totally funky graph. And it, this, uh, I guess Desmos doesn't do a good job of it. it. It will graph the right piece of it, but when x is negative, you're going to have some weird things over here. Uh, let's, let me just try one thing. Let's just see if this will do it in Wolfram Alpha or something automatically. No, no, it's doing the same thing. If you graph it in a more powerful graphing utility. If you write uh, anything on your computer, you're going to see a whole bunch of stuff. Now let's check. Let's just make an observation that we don't need a pi as our step. Uh, let's just make an observation. What? Oh, I put x to the x. What did I mean to do? This is why it didn't work, because I graphed the wrong function. I was surprised that it didn't graph it. So here is a picture of the gamma function. All right. But notice, what if we do something like f of, what should f of 2 be? All right, 2 factorial is 2. Mm -hmm. f of 5 is 5 factorial, which is 120. So if this function, the gamma function, is going to match for all those positive integers that you know how to do the factorial of. You know that 2 factorial is 2 times 1. You know that 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. This function matches for all the integers. So if we were to put our sequence in, I don't want to do it, but if we were to put our sequence in there, we would see that it's matching. Like there's one factorial is one comma one, two factorial is two comma uh, two, three factorial is three comma six, three comma six. So this function, this gamma function, matches for all those positive integer factorials that we already know how to do. But then you can do these weird factorials for some negative numbers and for fractions, which we'll study how you, fact, how you take the factorial of a fraction later. But, but you can see from looking at the graph that if you plug in 1 half, which is right there, you're going to get a number that looks like it's just under 1 right there. So 
that function, gamma function, you can actually look at the, a graph of these two functions relative to each other. Okay, but regardless, k factorial grows super quick, k to the k even faster, the fastest of them all. It's the rabbit. All right, so then if we pair these things off, this gets a little confusing, but let's try it. I'm going to put the factorials over each other first. So the k plus 1 factorial, remember that we could write it like that. Does anybody have an issue with that? So k plus 1 factorial is the same as k plus 1 times k factorial. Any issues? Will you remind us why real quick? So if we look at it, the simplest way to remind you is to look at numerical examples. So if we have something like 9 factorial, that's 9 times 8 times 7 all the way down, 3, 2, 1. Yeah. So we could write 9 factorial as 9 times 8 factorial. Or we could write 9 factorial as 9 times 8 times 7 factorial. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of put that factorial with whatever factor we want, depending on what we need for cancellation purposes. It's the one before k plus 1. Yep, so we have k plus 1 in the next term to the right, which is 1 less than it. So to get from one factor to the next, we keep subtracting off 1. So if we start at 9, it's then 8, subtract 1, subtract 1, subtract 1, all the way down to 3, 2, 1. So you can always move that factorial symbol through your product of factors. Then, so I fa I'm looking at just these two. Now let's go to the other two. We can write that top one as k plus 1 times k plus 1 to the k, kind of similar to the last one we did, so that these two then have the same exponent. And we can mush those together. <coughs> Okay, so certainly cancellation right here, those go away. How about a k plus 1? Doesn't that also go away? So we get that. And let's see what happens. Let's see if our hunch was right. So the limit as k goes to infinity of this, that, and usually when you first see the whole E business, it's usually written in this form, so I typically we'll go back to that. That's E to the 1. So what does that tell us? For a geometric series, if we have a ratio that, that's bigger than 1, so what's our conclusion? So we diverge. So we diverge because that is greater than 1. So diverge by ratio test. R is bigger than 1. <clears throat> so we really need to remember this geometric series conclusion because that's going to be the same conclusion that we use for the ratio test and the root test. And the thing that we have to be careful of Remember when we did the integral test? So the integral test said if the integral, which was an improper integral, if it was finite, if it converged, then the series did the same thing. So we've got to make sure we keep that straight. So here we get this finite number. Don't mistakenly say, oh, it's finite, therefore we have convergence. We have to remember how we're grouping our conclusions. Root, ratio, and geometric series we have to have a number between 0 and 1 for convergence. Okay. Integral test, as long as the integral was finite, then the series was also finite. We're going to have this same issue when we do a limit comparison test later today. So we just want to try to group our tests together. So root ratio and geometric series all together. We get an R value between 0 and 1, convergence. So does the fact that we got a constant this time, is, maybe it's just the way it's set, or does it actually mean that because they're each growing very quickly, they're mm -hmm. just not growing as far apart as the first question we did them? Uh, that's right. That's right, because the ratio here is smaller than the ratio was there. Right. So it's still the ratio of consecutive terms 
it's eventually like multiplying by e again and again and again. So it's like a geometric series where you're multiplying by 2.7, multiply by 2.7 again and again and again. <clears throat> Whereas the previous one, uh, that limit was big. So th that this is simply telling us that that grows so much faster than 2 to the k. Whereas k factorial and k to the k, k to the k is growing faster, but it's still kind of in the same ballpark because the ratio between consecutive terms is finite. But it's still bigger than 1, so it still diverges. Yeah? Uh, I'm sorry I keep asking these, but the k plus 1 times k plus 1 to the k, how did you get there? So if you have something like 5 to the 3, can't you write that as 5 times 5 squared? Yeah. So it's that idea. So if we had 5 to the k plus 1, we could write that as 5 times 5 to the k plus, uh, 5 to the k. Okay. Right, because this exponent is a 1, so if we combine those, we get k plus 1. Right, so if we have, so this tells us that we're multiplying 5 by itself k plus 1 times. So we could take 5, multiply itself by itself k times, and then one more time. <clears throat> One more. You guys try this one. So, you're ready, I can tell. I see everybody aching to do one by themselves. So, the ratio test. Pop your hand up if you're absolutely confused, moderately confused, or slightly confused. <laughs> so k plus one, one of the steps. K plus one factorial. start these, it's good to do that hunch thing to yourself at least. And when you look at that, what's everybody's hunch? Because is that denominator growing faster than the numerator? Moderately confused. <laughs> Moderately confused. Alright, it's just this one right here. Like, no. No. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> nope. That's the only part I can't get that. That in some ways that's the hard part. That's a calc one thing. We'll we'll talk let's talk about a couple of different ways. First step is to write the a sub k plus 1. So we replace the two k's with k plus 1. And then we have to divide by the a sub k term, so we reciprocate and multiply. And the factorials, even though they're kind of new, actually, 
a lot of you are getting them pretty quickly. So I would kind of group it that way. Put the polynomials over the polynomials, put the factorials over the factorials. We see that the k plus 1 pulled off will leave us with a k factorial, which will cancel with the numerator. Now, the k plus 1 over here, that will cancel with one of the factors of k plus 1 in the numerator. So that gives us. Uh, k plus 1 to the fifth over k to the sixth. All right. Now here, we have a polynomial over a polynomial. And when you have a polynomial over a polynomial, what you can do is just keep the dominant term of the polynomial in each place. So this limit is the same exact limit as this. Those are equal. We can take that fifth degree polynomial, right? If you were to multiply that all out, you'd have k to the fifth plus constant times k to the fourth plus constant times k third plus constant times k squared plus constant, right? And the dominant term is the k to the fifth. So you can just take away all that extra stuff. That k to the fifth term is going to be the dominant term for that numerator's polynomial. That's going to simplify it a lot. And so, and you can think in your head, if you need to, you can, we could even do this. We could even, if we want, if that makes you feel, you know, a little, you feel some queasiness, you can imagine all this, right? Plus a constant, I'll just put a C there. So we've got this addition here, and there's some sort of coefficients. Oh, this is a perfect time to use those little pies. So we have some sort of coefficients in there. Right? And that technique in, in uh, Calculus 1 where we would just divide everything by k to the 6. So here we're going to get k to the 4th over k to the 6. That's going to go to 0. k to the 3 over k to the 6. That's going to go to 0 because the denominator power is bigger. So all that stuff just goes to 0 really instantaneously. So we only have to consider this and that we have the same conclusion. That is going to be the limit of that, which is the limit of that, which is 0. OK, so now we've got the limit. Now we have to make the right conclusion. Root ratio and ge geometric series, the GS, those all have the same conclusion are less than 1 in magnitude, we have convergence. So this is an R value that's equal to 0, so we have convergence. So we have convergence by ratio test. R is less than 1. Good? All right, let's have a break. I'm going to try to find Elizabeth and Diana. I scold them. The next test is the root test. So the root test, the nice thing is that it's parallel to the ratio and the geometric series. So the root, the ratio, and the GS, same conclusion. Less than 1, convergence. Greater than 1, divergence. And then for the root and the ratio, a, a value of 1, it's inconclusive. So why they use a row instead of an R, who knows? But same thing, though. We're just going to take the limit. Most of the books just use an R anyway. And what we're going to do is take the limit of the kth root of a sub k. And let's just take a look at why this is really just another geometric series type of series. So we're going to assume that this limit exists. 
So we're going to assume that rho, if we go far out to the tail of the series, that rho is about the kth root of base of k. So we're assuming that the kth root of base of k is approaching rho. So in other words, you can think of going far out in the series and the term being rho to the k. Right? So if we have rho is about the kth root of a sub k, we can take the kth power of both sides. So a sub k is about rho to the k. And if you say that the limit exists, if you say the <coughs> limit of the kth root of a sub k is rho, that means eventually the kth root of a sub k is about rho. And then you could take the kth power of both sides so that a to the k is about rho to the k. And then we have the same multiplying effect with rho. So we see, oh yeah, it's, it's acting like a geometric series. So if it's going to act like a geometric series, we'll have convergence when rho is less than 1, greater than or equal to 0, because we have positive terms. <coughs> then we have divergence if rho is greater than 1, and inconclusive if rho is equal to 1. So let's go ahead and try the root test and the obvious type of problem to try the root test on is these ones that many of these ones we were trying to use the divergence test where we take the limit of it using the log the log of a limit well with the root test we can just ditch the k instantly so we take the limit of the kth root of a sub k. And that just pops the exponent right off. So we get the limit of 2 to, uh, excuse me, the limit of 2k over k plus 1. <coughs> right, the kth root of a kth power, they undo each other, so we just have what's in the parentheses. And what's that limit equal to? So converge or diverge? Diverge instantly. 2 is greater than 1, therefore diverge by root test. <clears throat> yeah. So this works really quickly if we have a big power of k on the outside. So the root test will not be a good selection if you have a factorial. Trying to take the kth root of a factorial, no can do. No, don't try it. Don't try it. You just won't get anywhere. So let's try this one. So here we see a k. We see that kth power down there. So we're hoping that taking the kth root is going to be really helpful. Let's see if it is. So we get that. And then, huh. All right, so then in the numerator, we have the kth root of k squared. In the denominator, we just have a 2. Now I'm going to rewrite that numerator. You're familiar, I think, with how you can move exponents around. Like if we have the cubed root of x squared, we could write that as the cubed root of x quantity squared. We could do that because this is all equal to x to the 2 thirds. And you always have a choice when you have a rational exponent. If you have x to the, let's just call it m over n, you could either do the nth root of x to the m, or you could do the nth root of x all raised to the m. You can you can trigger whichever one you want first. The denominator is always a root. The numerator is always a power. You could trigger the power first and then the root, or you could trigger the root first and then the power. It doesn't matter. Those are equivalent. So what I want to do is rewrite this one so that it's the limit of the kth root of k quantity squared. And then that's all divided by 2. Let's pull that 2 out in front as a 1 half. And then like we've said multiple times and like you learned theoretically in Calc 1, you can push the limit through continuous functions. 
And so what we could do is this. We could, whoops, I forgot the word limit. We could take the limit of k root of k and then square it all. Okay. So we're pushing the limit inside the squaring function. And so we need to know what the heck the kth root of k does as k goes to infinity. Very important limit. This is a limit that you must know. You need to know as a base limit. What does the kth root of k do? Let's take a look. So kth root of k. So I'm going to convert it to x's. So you could write it either way. Exactly. So we're going to take the, we want to know the limit as, as k goes to infinity, or as x goes to infinity, we're going to take the natural log of both sides. And when we take the natural log of the right side, we get that. <coughs> then we're going to take the limit of both sides. And on the left side, that limit gets pushed inside the log function. Again, because the log is continuous, the limits can push through continuous functions. And isn't this in L'Hopital's L'Hopital's form right away? Right? It's infinity over infinity right away. This is going to unravel really fast. So take the derivative. And what's that limit equal to? Zero. 1 over x goes to 0 as x goes to infinity. <clears throat> so this tells us when we exponentiate both sides, so the limit of y as x goes to infinity is going to be e to the 0, which is 1. So the kth root of k, as k goes to infinity, that limit will be 1. So if you're trying to visualize this sequence, you're taking the, you're starting with 1, and then we're taking the square root of 2, and then we're taking the cubed root of 3, and then we're taking the fourth root of 4, and then the fifth root of 5, etc. So that's the sequence that we're looking at. And so that sequence, you can plot it in Desmos also, you'll see that that sequence is approaching the value of 1. So the limit of the kth root of k is 1. Super important basic limit, kind of a fundamental limit that you'll need to know. So this whole, our conclusion here then is that this limit is, so that's going to be 1. 1 squared is 1, and then we multiply by 1 half, and so we get a 1 half. So what is our conclusion? Convergence. So 1 half is less than 1, therefore converge by root test. <clears throat> and again, I forgot to ask ahead of time, when we look at this, our hunch, based on our knowledge of growth rates, our hunch would be that this would converge because we have a polynomial divided by an exponential, and exponentials grow much more quickly than polynomials, so we would expect the terms to be going to zero quickly enough to have convergence. So our hunch would be that we have convergence. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, we just did that. One. <laughs> k through to k. One. All right, let's try this one. You guys try this one, 26. So. Try that with the root test. Take the limit of a sub k to the 1 k. As k goes to infinity. Is that e to the k? The yes, that's e to the k.
Ouais, c'était bien. Ouais, c'était bien. Juste. Oni. 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 All right. So, yeah, you can kind of, the more you play with these, the more you can almost see where it's going to go and how it's going to get to where it's going to go quickly. So we have the kth root of k and the limit of that we already, we just saw, is going to be 1. So we're going to do this. And the kth root of the denominator is just e. So the limit of the numerator is 1. The denominator is a constant. This is less than 1, so therefore convergence. Convergence by root test. Yeah, not too bad. That's great. So I'm really trying to emphasize root ratio and GS all the same. Less than one convergence. Got to get that down. Root ratio, root ratio and the GS. The giant slalom. The giant slalom. <laughs> Less than one converge. The GS. All right, so let's go to. Uh, some slightly more theoretical tests that take a little bit more detective work. Not quite as prescriptive. Ratio and root test are nice because you have a ratio, use the ratio test. You have a power, use the root test. Like those, and there's very prescriptive steps. Comparison test is a little finicky. And let's sort of describe it conceptually first. So we were thinking about two series that have positive terms again. And what we're going to say here is that the, the B sub K terms are larger than the A sub K terms. And then down here we're saying the A sub K terms are larger than the B sub K terms. So here's what we're thinking. If the B sub K terms are bigger and B sub, the series of B sub K converges, that means the series A sub K must also converge. If the bigger series converges, the smaller series must converge. Does that make sense? So the series A sub K is going to be smaller than the series B sub K. And if the series B sub K converges, then the series A sub K must converge also, must converge to something smaller. And here's the, 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 the other angle here. Same idea, but here we know that series B sub K diverges. Well, if series B sub K diverges and series A sub K is bigger, then series A sub K must diverge. So we're trying to decide on series A sub K. A sub K is always the one we start with. And then we have to sort of construct or manufacture series B sub K. And series B sub K has to do something that we know. So if we find a series B sub K that converges, then series A sub K converges. If we find a series B sub K that diverges, and we're in this lower situation, then series A sub K diverges. All right. So that's the idea. Bigger series converges, smaller series converges. Smaller series diverges, bigger series has to diverge. All right. Okay. So that's the, that's the intuition. So let's just take a look here. I have a couple of graphs. Um, and th this statement right here is just talking about something that we've referred to lots of times. The convergence of a series depends on the tail. So this is just saying this relationship, one of these relationships eventually holds. It doesn't matter if it doesn't hold for the first one million terms, but if eventually, a sub k is always bigger than b sub k, or b sub k is always bigger than a sub k, that's fine. Right? The, what happens in the front of the series does not matter. But in the tail, if one of these relationships is eventually established, then we can use this test. So we can't use this test if there's you know, all this back and forth. But if eventually one of them dominates the other, then we can use this test. So here's a picture, simple picture. We have 1 over k squared. We know that converges. If we add a 10 in the denominator, is that going to change the series from convergent to divergent? No. Those series should behave in a similar way. So let's see if we can establish the relationship here. So what is the direction of the inequality here? Should it be 
Opening to the left or opening to the right? Like that. We've increased the denominator here. If we increase the denominator, we decrease the fraction. Everyone follow that logic? So if we look at 1 over k squared, that's kind of where we're starting. But if we, if we increase that denominator, don't we decrease the fraction value? And so that's the direction of the inequality. Does this work? Yes, because this series, series 1 over k squared, we know that that converges by p series. So this is going to be one of the series we use to compare a lot with, a p series or a geometric series. Those are two that we kind of use as comparisons because we know a lot about them really easily. What was the factor, what was the condition in a p series? So if that exponent has to be greater than 1, if it's greater than 1, then we have convergence for a p-series. One point anything above zero, and we have convergence. So now we have bigger series converges, therefore the smaller series converges. So our conclusion then is that this converges. You can just write that as series a sub k. So it converges by comparison. Now, this comparison does not, it's, sometimes your comparison is not going to work. And it, here's a very simple one where your comparison is not going to work. Um, let me just jump to a new slide for a minute. So, no. What if we had series 1 over k squared minus 10? Do we think that that's going to converge or diverge? Converge? Yeah, we, right? If we just subtract 10, that's pretty trivial. That's not going to offset the convergence of k squared. So our hunch would be, oh yeah, that's got to converge. All we did was fiddle with this denominator by a small constant value. So our hunch would be that it converges. But notice what happens when we look at our comparison. When we do this, we made this denominator smaller. So this fraction is bigger. Oops, that's a k squared. So now here, we have a convergence series for sure, but it's smaller than our, our b sub k series. So convergence of a smaller series doesn't help us with a bigger series. So direct comparison does not work here because we can't establish the inequality in the direction that needs to be established to use the comparison test. So we have a convergent series. That can't tell us anything about a bigger series. A convergent series can tell us that a smaller series converges. Now up here, if we had the smaller series diverging, then we could conclude that this diverged. Like for example, if we have 1 over k minus 1. What's your hunch there? Diverge or converge? Diverge. <laughs> Our hunch is that it diverges. It's almost the geometric, uh, it's almost the harmonic series. And it's almost 1 over k. So it should diverge. Let's check. So first, let's see if we can establish the correct relationship here. Oh, actually, we can here, can't we? All right? So this denominator is smaller, so this is bigger. Now we have the smaller series diverging, so the bigger one diverges. So this diverges by comparison to this. And this is a diverging p-series. Diverging p-series. <clears throat> but what about if we did this? Series 1 over k plus 1. Obviously, it's got to diverge, but Let's try to establish our limit, or excuse me, our inequality. Huh. This denominator is bigger, so that fraction is smaller. So that doesn't work. 
Here we have the bigger series diverges, so it doesn't tell us anything about a smaller series. If the bigger one diverges, the smaller one might diverge or it might converge. It doesn't tell us anything. So the comparison test only works if you can establish this nice inequality symbol that it's in the right direction. But you see how easy it is to move to an inequality symbol where, um, where it's not going to work, where the test is inconclusive. We can't make a conclusion there. Even though we know, we know it's got to diverge. So what that leads us to is something called the limit comparison test. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And some folks say, well, heck, if the comparison test might lead us down this road where you can't establish the right inequality, why not just do the limit comparison test every time? And the answer is because sometimes on the test it's going to say use the direct comparison. <laughs> <laughs> but the limit comparison will always work. So in practice, on your homework, it, you can always do that. But the direct comparison is really helpful in kind of establishing the, some good algebra skills when you're kind of thinking about do, does the inequality work or not. The direct comparison really gets you to think about, okay, the smaller series is conversion. Can that tell me anything about a bigger series? Or the bigger series is diverging. Can that tell me anything about a smaller series? It really helps to orient good intuition for how series compare to each other. So the direct comparison probably is a better series to try because it builds better intuition. The limit comparison will always work. So in practice, if you're just trying to rush through and get something done, the limit comparison would work better. Um, but if you're trying to develop your intuition for series, the direct comparison is a good, good one to work on. OK. So this picture down below, <coughs> we have it's a picture of two series. We know that this one diverges because it's a P series where P is less than 1. For a P series to converge, P has to be greater than 1. So here we had less than 1, so it's diverging. And this other series, 1 over the square root of K minus 3, all we did was a little shift. So don't we expect them both to diverge? Let's just notice, can we get the inequality to work here in the right way? So if we take our series 1 over root k, and we take our series 1 over root k minus 3, which direction? Should it be bigger to the right or bigger to the left? Bigger to the right? Because we shrunk the denominator. If you shrink the denominator, you increase the fraction value. So this one is bigger, and so is this the correct inequality? Yes, because we know this series diverges. This one is bigger than it, so that means it must diverge. A series bigger than a divergent series must diverge. Okay, so here we can conclude that series A sub K diverges by comparison. Because we have that a sub k is bigger than b sub k, and series b sub k diverges. But what if we change that minus to a plus? If we change that minus to a plus, we can't get the inequality to be in the correct direction, so it's inconclusive, so we'd have to go to this other test, which we call the limit comparison test, which we'll get to shortly. <coughs> OK, so here is where I kind of explain that idea. So f series that we suspect converge or diverge, but don't fit nicely with the comparison test because the inequality is not working how we want, then we're going to use the limit comparison test. So here's basically the example I just had on the board in the previous slide. Can't get it to go the right way. Divergent series can't tell us anything about a smaller series, even though we know that thing's got to diverge. So here's how the limit comparison test works. The limit comparison, we just take the limit of a sub k divided by b sub k. So a sub k is the one we're trying to analyze. b sub k is coming from a series that we know. We know it converges or we know it diverges. So here's our conclusion. 
If the limit is a finite positive number, then both series do the same thing. <coughs> Very similar to the integral test. Remember the integral test, we did that improper integral, and if the integral converged, then the corresponding series converged. Same idea there. It didn't matter what it converged to. If it converged to some finite number, that improper integral converged to some finite number, then the, then the uh, series converged. So same thing here. Same idea. If the limit's finite, the series do the same thing. They both converge or they both diverge. Now, this little subtlety down here is very difficult to grasp the first couple times you read it. So let's first focus on number one. On number two, the simplest, I'll, I'll say it once, and then when it comes up with homework, we can re-talk about it, but it's very hard to get these initially. So what we're saying here is if this limit is finite, if it's zero, so it doesn't fit in up here, so if it's zero, that means that the a sub k's are going to zero faster than the b sub k's are doing whatever they're doing. The a sub k's are going to zero fast enough that as long as b sub k converges, then a sub k must also converge. So if this limit is zero and the denominator converges, then a sub k must also converge. If the denominator diverged, that can't tell us anything about a sub k converging. If the numerator diverges, then that limit's got to be zero anyway. If the denominator is going to infinity, so those are getting big, then this limit has to be zero. So that's not going to tell us anything about a sub k. If we, but if the denominator is converging and that limit is zero, that tells us that the a sub k's are going to zero faster than the b sub k's, so that means that a sub k converges. So these two special cases are little, very, very subtle, these two. Similarly, if that limit's infinity and our series that we know about diverges, then a sub k must also diverge. So we'll look at those two special cases when they come up. 90% of the time, you're in step one. And that's the part we want to master first. Limit comparison, take the limit, get a finite number, done. They both do the same thing. So let's go ahead and try. Let's actually go back to the ones that I suggested and let me show you how we could work them. So here, direct comparison does not work. Of course, our hunch is that that has convergence because we have a k squared in the denominator, so it's like, it's like a p-series that converges. So let's take our limit. Let's see what we can do. So let's take the limit of a sub k over b sub k a sub k is the one we're analyzing. So that's in the numerator. So that's the limit 1 over k squared minus 10. b sub k is the one that we know its behavior. So it's a p-series or a gs. So we have to divide by b sub k, so that means multiply by the reciprocal. And what is that limit equal to? 1. We have two polynomials, power 2 quotient of leading coefficients, so that limit is going to be equal to 1. So therefore, this is a finite number, so to indicate this, quite frequently we use, um, we use a symbol, we say that this is a, a positive real number, so that's what we need it to be. If it's a positive real number, so it's not 0 and it's not infinity, if it's a positive real, then we have convergence. And here's the notation that we, the book doesn't use this, but frequently we'll use this epsilon symbol to mean an element of a set. And the real numbers we designate in math like that. And if I put a plus up here, that means that this number is a positive real number. That means that it's not zero, it means it's not infinity, it's an element of the positive reals. So this just means it's positive and finite. 
You could all absolutely write positive and finite. But in order for that to work, it has to be both positive and finite. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, and it's kind of redundant. If we say the number is finite, that kind of implies it's not infinity, but they're really trying to emphasize that it's both, even though it's kind of redundant. If you say the number is finite, and we're dealing with a series of positive values, then... Yeah. So you write like, you know, whatever your limit is and then you yep. write those symbols and that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, so we somehow we have to indicate that the limit is a positive real number. So it's like the number and then saying this it's is a positive, positive real number. Therefore, both series do the same thing. Okay. Okay. So, so what I say is that if this is positive and finite, that means so therefore the series are linked. They do the same thing. The series, ah, that one. So the series do the same thing. They're linked. So they, they behave in a similar way. So our final conclusion is therefore series A sub K diverges. Oh, converges, sorry, converges, converges. They do the same thing. So therefore, series A sub K converges by limit comparison. I know, I know. Our preliminary answer, medium answer, and our final answer. So limit comparison, if we get a finite real number, both series do the same thing. All right, so let's check this one. So here's our inconclusive one. So the series we're investigating is this one. So we're going to take the limit of our a sub k divided by b sub k means multiply by the reciprocal. And what's that limit? 1. And so here, to distinguish that we're not dealing with the geometric series conclusions, that's why we want to be really clear. We have to somehow indicate that this is a positive real number. So this is an element of the positive reals. Therefore, we have divergence. And so is that exactly how you'd want us to try to test? Or, or you can use the words. You could use the words, since this is a positive real, both series behave the same way, both series diverge. Somehow you just have to indicate that you're, the series you're comparing it to is divergent. So then the series you're analyzing is also divergent. It's only inversely for zero. It is, so not quite. It diverge, so here our B sub K is a divergent series. So we're, we're, our hunch is that this diverges, so we're going to do a limit comparison to something that diverges. So whether they both converge or both diverge, we get a positive real as the limit. So they both do the same thing. So it all depends on what you're choosing for your B sub K. Here I chose a divergent series because my hunch is that this diverges. So I take the limit, I get a positive real, so therefore the series we're analyzing diverges because the one we compared it to diverges. So this positive real says that the series do the same thing. They either both can diverge or they both converge. So when we look up here, here the series I chose, um, where did I, so this series right here, this is a convergent P series. So here, I, my hunch is that it converges, so I'm comparing it to a convergent series. We get our finite answer for the limit. So therefore, they both do the same thing. I compared it to a convergent, so it must be a convergent. Are we going to need to come up with a series to compare? Yes. How do you get that series? Get rid of all the extra stuff. So this one's not too hard. We just get rid of coefficients. We get rid of um, non-dominant terms. So we pretty much just reduce it all the way down to the core of the, of the A sub K. And so you'll just do that with every comparison test? And that's kind of how you build, whether you're doing direct comparison or limit comparison, that's kind of how you get the series that you're going to compare it to. 
you look at the, the core of the series by taking away non-dominant terms, coefficients, simplifying if you had a square in the numerator and a cube in the denominator, reduce it to 1 over x or 1 over k. Yeah, so let's try it. All right, so. <clears throat> Okay, comparison test. So that we've, we've kind of actually done something like this already, but we'll just, can't hurt to do another one. So we've got that multiplier in the numerator. That's just a constant. And if we're trying to generate our b sub k, we're going to ignore constants. We're going to ignore non-dominant terms. So the series that we're going to definitely compare to is 1 over k. And we know that this is a divergent p-series. So that's going to be our b sub k. So we then try to establish our relationship. If we want to, we could factor out that constant to the front and just ignore it, because multiplying by 0 0.0001 does nothing for convergence or divergence. So we really, we could do this. This probably would simplify it. So we're just looking at the, um, as our a sub k term, just looking at 1 over k to the fourth. Forget about the constant multiplier. <clears throat> so let's first check. Can we do a direct comparison? So we come over to the side. We've got our 1 over k. We've got our 1 over k plus 4. Now we have to establish the inequality symbol. Does it work? Let's see. Bigger denominator, smaller fraction value. So does the direct comparison work? No, because the series B sub k diverges, so it can't tell us anything about a smaller series. So this, so direct comparison, inconclusive. Inconclusive. So, limit comparison. Limit comparison, we take the limit of A sub k Divided by b sub k, we can again forget, let's just look here, forget about that coefficient. So we have, there's our a sub k. Divided by b sub k, we multiply by the reciprocal. So we get that. And that limit is 1. That's a positive real number. It's an element to the positive reals. Therefore, both series diverge. <clears throat> so they both have to do the same thing. So our conclusion is that this one diverges by limit comparison. That's a DIV. Diverge by limit comparison test. So we use Lipitol's rule for um, KO, limit of K over K plus 4 plus 1, right? You can. You can do one of two things. So you can think of, if you have k over k plus 1, you can absolutely say, hey, both go to infinity. So you can take the derivative of both, totally fine. Or you can use the, the divide by the dominant term thing. Divide everything by k, and you have the limit of 1 over 1 plus 1 over k. That goes to 0, so the whole limit goes to 1. So you can think in terms of polynomials. Or you, or, and the third way, you could say, oh, polynomials both of degree 1, so the limit is the ratio of coefficients. So there's three ways you can think about that limit. Three ways. Divide by the dominant term, use L'Hopital's rule, or quotient of polynomials that have the same power. All right, yeah, when I'm getting, uh, when I use L'Hopital's on this specific one, I get 1 over 1 over 4. Uh, that derivative of this is 0. Uh, oh, right. Right? So derivative of k is 1, derivative of k is 1. Okay, yeah, so yeah. derivative of that term is 0. Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah? Get to to do so if you do L'Hopital's rule, you just have to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> and, then it, <laughs> and then it works great. <laughs> that applies to all math. That applies to all math. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Oh man, why do I have so many on this slide? <clears throat> All right, so let's look at this one. Okay, so 
what do we think our comparison series would be? 3K plus 1. So 1 over, we have two terms here. And we're shrinking this denominator by that amount. 3 to the K is bigger than this 2 to the K. So this, this, that's where the, the hunch should be. We could even try it with 1 over 2 to the K also. But it's, it's more like if you look at this one, we're looking at that term right there that you know, sort of dominates the 4. 3 to the K dominates 2 to the K. 3 to the K grows faster than 2 to the K. So 3 to the K dominates. So that's the series I would say we want to compare to. Let's try a direct comparison. I guess first off, hunch, converge, or diverge? So we have an exponential in the denominator. Right? This is an exponential minus an exponential, but that's a dominant exponential. My, you, and you could easily say, hey, it's an exponential minus an exponential, so it's a little bit indecisive. But this exponential is bigger than that one, so we think we probably converge. Probably converge. So let's find out. This one definitely converges, and that's a di this is a convergent geometric series. Convergent GS. Does everyone agree? Typically, the way we write our geometric series is to put the power all the way on the fraction value there. But they're going to disguise it like this quite a bit. So the ratio here, the common ratio is 1. So R equals 1 third, which is less than 1, which is why we have convergence for that GS. <coughs> So let's see if the inequality <coughs> pans out the way we need it to first. So let's put down our a sub k. Let's put down our b sub k. Smaller denominator, bigger fraction value. Is that the direction that we need it for a direct comparison? This converges. Our a sub k is bigger. Can a convergent series directly tell us anything about a bigger series? No. <clears throat> so direct comparison is inconclusive. So direct comparison definitely is not going to work there. So let's let's get let's let's take these and move them. <clears throat> so direct comparison does not work. So we are going to go with a limit comparison. So let's try the limit then. So we're going to take the limit of a sub k over b sub k. a sub k is the one we start with. b sub k is the one we generate by getting rid of the extra stuff, by getting rid of non-dominant terms and constants. So here's our a sub k. That's a sub k. b sub k, the one we're going to compare it to is 3 to the k, 1 over 3 to the k. So we multiply by its reciprocal. And what's that limit? One is a great answer. So if we divide everything by 3 to the k, we get that. So divide every term by 3 to the k. 3 to the k divided by 3 to the k is 1. 3 to the k divided by 3 to the k is 1. 2 to the k divided by 3 to the k. Let's check. So if we rewrite the, that denominator term, isn't that 2 thirds to the k? And what happens to just this little guy here as k goes to infinity? Zero, because we have a proper fraction. Two-thirds times two-thirds, getting smaller. Multiply by two-thirds again, getting yet smaller. So that will go to zero, so our limit will be one. And if our limit is one, we have that both series do the same thing because we have a positive real. 
This is an element of the positive reals. So that tells us that both series do the same thing. And then we go back to the series B sub K that we selected and we say, ooh, that was a convergent series. So then we conclude that series A sub K converges. So therefore, series A sub K, the one we're trying to analyze, converges by limit comparison test. <clears throat> so a couple of things that we need to be clear. We need to somewhere state what the series we are choosing to compare to. Somewhere we need to state what it does. So here we're going to choose this as our B sub K, and that's going to be a convergent geometric series because the common ratio is less than 1. So somewhere we need to indicate, is our B sub K converging or diverging? And then, you know, then we just have to somehow make our conclusion that we get a, a positive real, so therefore we have convergence by limit comparison test. They both do the same thing. Very similar to the integral test where the integral and the infinite series did the same thing if we had a positive real answer. All right. Okay, kth root of k plus 2 in the denominator. So that's not a multiple, right? That's a kth root. I think it just came over cross bunny. K time. Kth root, not a k times. If someone has a book, you can look it up. But that little k is not, I don't think it's a multiplier. It's about the same size. All of a sudden, yeah, it's about the same size. Does someone have their book with them? Or have the online book pulled up? Yeah. Battery's dead. Battery's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Your book has a battery? <laughs> so, okay, so let's, let's ask both questions. If this is a kth root, what do you suspect? That's a kth root. What do you think? So the very first test that we learn is the divergence test. And that's kind of the first thing. Anytime you see a series, the first thing you should ask yourself, do the terms, what do the terms have to go to for there to even be a conversation of convergence? Zero. Zero. So let's just check. If if this was a kth root, the kth root of k plus 2, so if it's a kth root, what is that limit? One. So we just learned a few minutes ago that the kth root of k goes to 1. So if we do the kth root of k plus 2, that limit's still also going to be 1. So this is 1, therefore we would have divergence. Because the limit of a sub k has to be 0 for there to be convergence. If the limit of a sub k plus, if the limit of a sub k is not 0, you know divergence is what's going on. All right, so if it was a kth root, definitely divergence. Now if it's a k times, which it definitely could be, I mean it looks like it's about the same size, what do we think? Oops, that again? Oh, oh, multiplier. Yeah, so if that k is a multiplier and not, not a root. So if it's a multiplier. It's exactly the same. And it's, yeah. it's hard to tell. I mean, it just looks exactly the same. Does it look like a multiplier? Yeah, it looks like a, there it looks a little bit lower to me. There, I don't know. I think, I think this root, I think the root symbol comes across a little funny when I copy and paste. So that root symbol looks like it, I don't know. I think it's supposed to be a multiplier though. I think, yeah, yeah, okay. Let's go with multiplier now. Okay. So what do we think? So do we think converge or diverge if it's a multiplier? Converge. converge. Because essentially the denominator is k to the 3 halves. If you get rid of the non-dominant stuff, you have k times the square root of k, which is k to the 3 halves. And that 3 halves is a p series with p bigger than 1. So that's our hunch, is that we have convergence. So our b sub k is going to be 1 over k to the 3 halves. 
Let's see if we can do a direct comparison. Denominator bigger, fraction smaller. Everyone agree? Denominator bigger, fraction smaller. So this is the correct relationship because we know that series 1 over k to the 3 halves converges by p series because 3 halves is greater than 1. Everyone agree? So then, so our conclusion is that the series a sub k, that's always the one we're analyzing. Instead of rewriting that whole thing, just series a sub k automatically means the one that we're analyzing converges uh, by direct comparison. Does everyone agree? So the bigger series converges which means the smaller one must also converge. If the bigger one converges, the smaller one has to converge. There's no way around it. So let me just put an if up here. So if it was a kth root. Okay, this one, what's our hunch here? So denominator k squared times natural log squared of k. Converge, right? If that natural log wasn't there, we'd have convergence. That natural log is a function that's going to infinity, so that can only accelerate the growth in the denominator, which means the fractions are going to zero even quicker than just, a, just 1 over k squared. So let's try a direct comparison first. So 1 over k squared, <coughs> that's a convergent p series. 2 is greater than 1. So convergent p series. Let's see if we can get the inequality to work. So we take our, try that first. <coughs> Bigger denominator, smaller fraction value. So does that work in the right direction? <laughs> yes, yes. Because the bigger series is convergent, therefore the smaller series must converge. The smaller series can't squeeze around the big series and all of a sudden diverge. So therefore, the original series, series a sub k, converges by a direct comparison, by direct comparison. <clears throat> direct comparison. Good? Great? Can you abbreviate uh, direct comparison, like direct DCT. DCT? Yeah, absolutely. Direct comparison test? Definitely. Definitely. I'll know what you mean. There are the guidelines for choosing the right test. <laughs> mayday, mayday. All right, we'll, we'll just sort of go through. So first thing is the divergence test. You don't even want to be thinking about whether a series converges if the limit of a sub k is not 0. If the limit of a sub k is not 0, you're done. Right. The limit of a sub k is not zero. There's no way the series can converge. For the series to converge, eventually you need to be adding negligible terms, which means eventually you need to be adding terms with a value close to zero. So if the limit of a sub k is not zero, that means that you're adding positive numbers that are substantial, like 1 half plus 1 half plus 1 half plus 1 half diverge. If the limit is not zero, diverge. Okay, and then they just say that we use the growth rate thing to figure out that limit. Yes, okay, we know that. So divergence test first. Then we look for our three special series. We have a GS, we have a PS, and we have a telescoping. 
So a geometric series, a P-series, or a telescoping series. Those are the three special ones that we looked at. Geometric series, we analyze quite a bit. Common ratio, less than one in magnitude, convergent, otherwise divergent. P-series, P bigger than one, convergent, divergent if P is less than or equal to one. Telescoping series are pretty obvious. You see a minus sign. You, know, you see that you could use partial fraction decomposition. Like those tend to be kind of like, oh, okay, I see. I've got to go with the telescoping. All right. The integral test is the one that's a little bit more subtle. And the way we think about it, if the general term, if a sub k, if it looks like a function we can integrate, then we can go with the integral test. If it looks easy to integrate, go for it. If it looks like u substitution will get you a good, easy, quick antiderivative, the integral test is a reasonable way to go. Now, lots of times, you could use more than one test. So integral test might work, ratio test, there's lots of overlap. So then we have our new ones. If, the, if a sub k has a factorial or powers, ratio test is usually a good way to go. And if we have a power of k on the outside, a big exponent of k, then the root test. <clears throat> and then the last thing is the comparison test. So if we can use one of the previous ones, go for it. If not, then we jump to our comparison. So ratio, root, and then comparison or limit comparison. So that those are all our tests so far. <laughs> we have one more main test, the alternating series test. The alternating series test means that you're going to be dealing with an alternating series. So that's kind of obvious, right? The series alternates. Hint, use the alternating series test. <laughs> but Because a lot of these said all the terms are positive, like the root test, the <coughs> ratio test. We're dealing with positive termed series. Brennan? <clears throat> Sorry. Is there a situation where you might need to use more than one test? Well, if we use the ratio test and we end up with a 1, or the root test and we end up with a 1, both those are inconclusive. And this is where the confusion gets. We have to be really clear that root ratio GS, you need a limit value less than 1 for convergence. Because then we have the limit comparison test and the integral test, where as long as you have a positive real, both do the same thing. So we've got to be really careful. If we get a, a positive one for the limit comparison or the integral test, totally fine. But if we get a positive one for root or ratio, then we have to try a different test. So we just have to kind of group our tests with similar conclusions. Root ratio of GS together integral test and limit comparison test, as long as, that, as long as we get a positive real, then both series do the same thing. So very common to get a, a one for a root or a ratio, then we have to try something else. All right, well, let's see. Oh, gosh, we only have another minute. Let's look at this one. Can anybody see? what a sub k is here. Say again? Close. It, well, is this n right here? The n is actually the denominator, right? So n minus 1 over n raised to the n. Right, these two are matching. That's matching with that. So, th so this would be the form. So we could write this as 1 minus 1 over n to the n. And what is the limit of this? Limit of that is? Limit of that is? E. e. <laughs> A 1 on top of an E. A, a one with an e at the base, yeah. So limit of that is e. So what do we conclude here then? 
So if the limit of a sub k is not 0, divergent. So right away we know that this diverges uh, because limit a sub k is not 0. If it's not 0, then we know it diverges. So we'll get to these other two. We'll finish these up on Thursday. Yeah. Good time. <laughs> Good time. Oh,